Well, are they Portuguese or are they Brazilians? Well, that, that, that's what, I don't know. I don't, is there a way to tell? I, I don't know. <laughs> oh, it was. It was just. It was interesting. Um, yeah, actually, there is. Were they? What did the women look like? <laughs> Hello and welcome to episode 106 of Dots, Lines, and Destinations. It is March 31st, 2016, and I am joined today by Seth Miller. Hey, Seth. Hello there, anonymous and I guess voice who never introduces himself. Yeah, I'm Stephen Seagraves. Yeah, there we go. <laughs> fix that for you? Okay. Rub it in. Yeah, that never gets old for me. <laughs> I, I always forget. Like I'm always like eager to like jump right in and introduce, especially when we have guests, but... I, I always forget to introduce myself. Well, I, I'm honored that I'm so important to the show that you forget about yourself. Well, you, you're the one who calls your you call yourself the Rambler, so you are important, Rambling yeah. Man. That's what, we should just nickname you the Lord, Rambler. I was born. <laughs> okay, I'm gonna have to pay if I sing anymore. We're gonna a lose all our listeners and b have to pay someone a copyright fee. Yeah, I don't feel like dealing with lo- uh, royalties, so let's knock that yeah. off. <laughs> um, today our dot is San Francisco. Uh, the line is Cairo to. Larnaca, hopefully pronouncing that correctly, and the destination's Berlin. So let's just get right on it. Uh, San Francisco, we chose the dot because of Virgin America and uh, the recent announcement that uh, they're seeking a buyer and that Alaska and JetBlue are interested. Um, what's your take? Well, let, let's be clear. No one's confirmed any of this, right? No it's one's all rumor. that they're seeking a buyer. It's all rumors and speculation and, you know, who the hell knows. But... Um, at one point there was also discussion of Etihad, I think possibly trying to do a foreign ownership, just a you know, minority stake as opposed to a full buyout. Yep. Um, you know, if it's a minority stake, I kind of don't care. And I'd wonder, you know, which of the major investors is giving up a stake, but it matters a little less to me. Mm-hmm. Um, I guess if it was Etihad and they joined the Etihad group and, you know, sort of became part of that alliance, things get interesting, but there's still not a ton of connectivity, you know. I, you know, would would you see Air Berlin try to fly a San Francisco route if that happened? I don't know. Like, there's some weird quirks about just the networks and the overlap there that doesn't make a ton of sense to me. Yep. Um, you know, I think that Alaska buying them would be a ludicrous proposition. Yep. Um, just because not, none of it meshes. Not none of it. Not, there's zero overlap. The fleet doesn't. The fleet, doesn't, the, match the, the fleet up. doesn't match. The culture doesn't match. The target markets don't match. The like the style doesn't match. None of it. None of it lines up. I all it does is eliminate one of four competitors on the West Coast. And at this point, if I'm Alaska, I'm thinking I need my capital to defend Seattle from Delta much more than I need it to add another hub in San Francisco. I mean, right, augmenting this, the like mini hub slash focus city they have in LA would be great, I guess. But would, would Alaska then pull back all the transcon flying? Yeah. Right? Alaska doesn't, does maybe one or two, one a day where they have transcon routes, maybe two in a couple markets, but I don't even think so. Um, so what, what would Alaska like become a transcon operator all of a sudden? Well, I, it, and, it, and, and I don't think they're that interested in San Francisco. I I think they're that more interested. Too. I think they're more interested in L.A. They've grown L.A. Um, a lot of one-off type routes out of L.A. They're doing well, so I I don't think their interest is in San Francisco. That's yeah. So my, I mean, it's and there's not enough L.A. involved to make it worth the purchase price, right? I mean, yeah. At that point, you're basically looking at something similar to what Southwest did with AirTran, where they bought them for the slots at DCA, LaGuardia, and Atlanta. And basically didn't care what the airline or anything else around it was. They got rid of all the planes. They got rid of, you know, even some of the routes. But damn it, they wanted those slots. And that's how they were going to get into the market. And they actually got it at a pretty good bargain, I think. Yep. So I just and I don't see that being the case with Virgin America's position for Alaska. I don't think there's enough at L.A. to make it worth it. And if the plan would be to, like, do a merger where they divest most of San Francisco anyways, that's just strange. To say nothing of the fleet challenges. Which which leaves JetBlue, and that's the interesting one because that one actually kind that's of makes the interesting one. Yeah, I mean that 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 makes sense. The JetBlue one makes yeah. some sense. I agree, and I, right, I mean, Common Fleet is great. JetBlue is making growing like gangbusters in the Transcon market. Um, you know, the last couple quarterly statements they've said Mint has been outperforming expectations, uh, which is their premium product. They just added it on the Boston to San Francisco route uh, last week, so. It's growing that as well. 
I could easily see that being some just a good mix, right? Mm-hmm. You you eliminate a competitor there, which lets you push prices up a little bit, which sucks for consumers, but it is what it is. JetBlue suddenly has a West Coast operation that they didn't have before. Um, they have 60-ish planes. I think yep. Virgin is like 58 or something like that with eight more due this year or something like that. So somewhere in the low to mid-60s planes that you all of a sudden get to try to sort of build a more filled network, especially if you're going to cut some of the transcon frequencies out. I don't know. I, I think that there could be a lot of synergies and the, the culture and the, you know, the style and whatever is a little closer. And I still don't think it's quite exactly the same. Yeah. But I, I will admit that I have a New York bias and I have a JetBlue bias. I like them. Um, I like the people I know there. I like flying on them. Um, I'm less impressed by Virgin America in general, the few times I've done it, but I feel like JetBlue knows what it's trying to do and trying to be better than Virgin America does when yeah. they sort of you know, put their best foot forward, so to speak, or say, this is what, this is our goal. This is, you know, the, you know, they use say the bringing humanity back to travel or whatever and their sort of party line, whatever it is that they're saying. I feel like they know better what they think they're trying to do mm-hmm. than Virgin America does. Virgin America is like, oh, we want to be for the cool business traveler, but also some leisure and also maybe Mexico and. Well, oh, and, look, Hawaii. That's great. Like they, they just, you know, it's we want business travelers, but we also need to be able to take them where they want to go on vacation. That's just, it's a weird it's a much stranger business model than what I feel like JetBlue has sort of decided it wants to carve out as its position in the market. Well, and we have to we have to kind of be honest. It, we as a show were kind of wrong in our predictions on how long Virgin America would last. I think back I'd have to go look up what episode it was. But I mean, we talked about it, we thought they were going to go under and they were struggling. Yeah, um they were. And um, so it's surprising that they've done so well or better than what we expected. Um and now these rumors are coming out now. You know, I think part of that is in the last couple of quarters, they're doing better than expected because fuel prices came back down. Um, but even prior to that, there were some other factors at play. I think they did finally start to figure out some of their route planning a little better and sort of get their head around some of the marketing stuff. So um, it's coming along, but it's not it's not all there yet. Well, and if, and if JetBlue was to buy them, I, I think Dallas as a hub would go away, right? I mean, they're not JetBlue's not going to keep that left field, but the two gates they fought so hard for yeah uh, i don't see them i see i see JetBlue selling them to to southwest for a nice penny do you think that the feds would actually let southwest own all 20 gates uh, would they though would they own all 20 or would they own they own 18 right now so how does delta still fly there uh they have a court order forcing southwest to let them co- eat to share a gate so maybe then delta buys one Sure, but if you're Virgin America slash JetBlue, especially if you're Jet, if you've got the memory of JetBlue being run out of Atlanta so hard, do you do anything to help Delta? <laughs> That's a good question. Right? So, or, maybe, so maybe you just keep them. mostly domestic and regional Americas. Do you do anything to help Southwest? Um, so maybe you just keep them. Keep yeah, the I mean, and... so right with, with the number of planes they'll have, an argument could be made that it's worth starting a mid-continent hub out of Love Field. I, I can't imagine they could do it out of love because they only have the two gates. So that's basically 20 flights a day at tops. Right? That's not a hub operation. But and I, I don't know where you'd put it. There was some some folks talking about Austin at one point. There's they need more gate space there, and there's construction planned to add some gates, but not enough soon enough. Um, I don't know where you'd put it. That'd be a big enough city for O and D traffic to balance out. You know that half of the needs for what a true hub needs. Kansas City, Missouri. Well, I did say mid-continent, didn't I? <laughs> um, glad you picked up on that. Uh, MCI. It, it's possible. I, I think it's unlikely. Yeah, I can't. I can't see them opening anything there. Maybe St. Louis. Maybe, but even yeah. that, even that O and D traffic is pretty. Recreate. Yeah, it's falling apart a little bit. Recreate the old American hub. I mean, you could go to Memphis. Right? Do, do you go back to old hubs? You could. You could win some people over that way. I would say that. I mean, um, Cleveland. <laughs> You know, things like that. You could you could probably yeah. win some hearts and minds by showing up there. Yeah, and Cleveland. I mean, it's funny you say Cleveland. JetBlue has actually just started expanding traffic there. Yeah, I, I, so I, th- I I think the Virgin America thing, if it was to happen, JetBlue makes a lot of sense to me. Um, I, I, the one thing that I do, there is a difference. Uh, I think they have different engine types on their Airbus fleet. So hmm. I did not consider that. But I don't I don't know how much of a big deal that is. I think it'd just be some training. I mean, couldn't really do some cross fleeting type stuff. But 
you know, they'd eventually work that out. Yeah. Um, if if they were to do, if they were to buy Virgin, do you think that their West Coast operation would take the take the form of like right now they run Seattle JFK on a red eye, they run Portland JFK on a red eye, um, and they also run Portland to Anchorage um, as a one off flight every now and then. Um, and they also run some other red eyes out of the West Coast. Do you think those would go away and feed that traffic into more mint flights out of San Francisco and L.A.? I do not. I think you keep the red eyes um, and you feed some. You can do daytime you know, flights that will still feed West Coast you know, transcon runs. But mm-hmm. I think that a lot of the uh, transcon red eyes would stay. I mean, here's the other thing to consider. I, I don't know the numbers for Virgin America. JetBlue, though, on their domestic routes is something like sub 10 percent connecting traffic. It's mostly O&D. Their, their passenger load is almost all O&D. Yeah. And I want to say for international is maybe 20% at most, 18%, I think they said maybe in the last quarterly call. Yeah. So it's it's a very different operation, uh, and it's a different sort of style of traffic than a traditional network carrier runs. And so at some point there, you know, when you get bigger and more complicated and start putting the extra connecting routes in, obviously you have to do that to be able to grow. There's not an infinite supply of O&D routes that are big enough to support operations. Yeah, but, I, well, I think that, like, for me, uh, for JetBlue to be an attractive – we talked about this before. To, for them to be an attractive option, I need West Coast feed. I don't want to fly a red eye to the East Coast and, and have that as my only choice. Um, so I, and I could, you want mint. And I want mint. I'd pay for mint. I'll pay for the premium. Yeah. Uh, so if if they if they were to say start something on the West Coast and allow me to feed traffic, you know – even to LA, even if they said, okay, we'll, we'll fly Portland, LA, LA, JFK, I, that works for me. Um, and yeah. I, would, I would take that any day over the cluster that is San Francisco from time to time. So, um, I, I, it's an interesting proposition and I think that they could grow. I mean, they have a huge, what, E190 fleet that they could, they could use out here on the West Coast as well. I, I mean, it makes yeah, sense. Yeah, it's about 60. They got about, I think they have 60 E90s. Um, they use them. I'll actually a decent amount out of San Juan too. Oh really? Yeah. Huh. So I, I I'm just thinking like you think you know thinking if you made Austin your your mid continental hub, um, you have E190s that are doing Austin West Coast and then Austin East Coast. That's how you're moving the planes around. Yeah. Um, just thinking about it that way. It it definitely it's intriguing. I I'm interested to see where it goes and if the rumors are actually can, can be uh, if someone actually confirms them at some point. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, uh, I have a feeling either that either that the transaction completes or that there was discussion or any of those things. Yeah, I, I I'd like to see it. So, it, it would. Do you know the real question? Do you think the FC the the uh, the federal government would allow such a, a buyout? I do. I think consolidation at the lower end would be permitted. Okay. I'm less convinced that you know that the DOJ would allow like United to buy Virgin Atlantic, or Virgin America. Yeah. Um and. The reality is it's probably not enough of a concentration in San Francisco to truly meet the threshold, but it would be a lot. And it's just hard to believe that that would be viable. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, yeah. So our, our line is Cairo to Larnaca, Cyprus. Um, and the only reason... Not, not, not a very common route. No. And the only reason we brought it up was because of the, the hijacking, in air quotes, that took place uh, this morning when we were recording the show on Tuesday morning uh, on that flight. It was actually a flight from... Uh, where was it from? It was going from Cairo to Alexandria. Is that right? Yeah, whatever HBE is. I think it's Alexandria. Yeah. Uh, and, and it actually had to divert to Larnaca, Cyprus. So... There is actually scheduled state daily service. Oh, really? Um, yeah, once a day, Egypt Air flies in the afternoon. Hmm. Um, so he- here's the thing, right? Everybody's safe. Turns out the guy didn't actually have a bomb. Uh, he claimed he had a bomb on his weight on his belt, and it turned out to be fake. Um, the pl- the pilots went with the flow, diverted, flew to Cyprus. Uh, they you know, declared the emergency, whatever. Landed. They negotiated with the guy. He was trying to see his estranged wife, who lives there apparently, mm-hmm. which is why he demanded that the plane go there. Um, and there's there's and you know all's well that ends well. He gets arrested because he's an idiot, and all the people walk away with a story to tell. Um, and we get you know content to talk about. 
So truly everybody wins. And, and, um, and one guy even got a selfie, which might be the so, dumbest so the, thing. So that was just, <laughs> that's one of the two things I wanted to bring up. So there's two things that came out of it that I think are hysterical. One is early on in the conversations, um, I think one, it's, I can't remember if it's the Egyptian foreign minister, someone when asked, like, is there a woman involved? There was rumors that it was related to his estranged wife. And the comment was something to the effect of a guy did something stupid. Of course, there's a woman involved. <laughs> um, and, and I could see that comment being taken one of two ways, right? Part of me says it, you know, one of the options is blame women, which is always women fault. Yeah. The other is men are stupid when women are involved. Yeah. Um, and I firmly believe, you know, in the latter men do stupid things all the time because they aren't thinking with their brain and it, I, I'm one of them. I do stupid things all the time too. Um, often for that same reason. So I don't know. It's a strange and bizarre quote. Um, but clearly led to many, many jokes, uh, on the internet <laughs> this morning. So, and, but yeah, the selfie, I can't even tell when it was taken. Was it taken? As the guy was hijacking the plane? Yeah, I, from what I've read and clearly don't know all the details, right, because I don't think anyone really does, um, it was relatively late in the event after they were on the ground in Cyprus. Hey, buddy, uh, let me take a picture with you. Like, how, so, does, how does that conversation even go? I would imagine something like, like, hey, as long as we're hanging out here, listen, this is almost over. Do you mind if I get a quick shot with you? This has been a great, you know, I've really enjoyed spending the last couple hours hanging out and chatting with you. I could see that sort of conversation angle working <laughs> i don't know i i also don't think it was such a stupid thing to do no i i i thought it was kind of it's kind of like turning the i mean i get it it it's making light of the situation but at the same time you know, planes have been hijacked and people have died on during hijackings and sure so at some point you decide right if i'm gonna if he's gonna kill me anyways might as well take a selfie might as well take a selfie if you're you know truly thinking you're doing something really good hey let's get a picture together and you then you can send it out to the world someone sees that you've got this maybe they could you know is, is he doing it so he can send it out and the cops can see a picture of the of the weapon yeah yeah right i can't i can't I, a i can't imagine he was actually thinking that but if he ever gets asked the question that should absolutely be his answer yeah i was just trying to gather intelligence and share it with the world so people could see that the that the bomb didn't look real um right i mean there, there's or like this is how I want to be remembered that I was, you know, confident and strong and having fun even in the face of danger. There's all sorts of reasons I can think of that it like it was actually not that stupid a thing to do. Yeah. Maybe that makes me similarly stupid, but that's sort of the angle I'm playing. <laughs> no, I mean, I don't I don't I'm not saying it was stupid. I think it was I think it was kind of crazy and Kind of dumb, but not. I mean, you, you, what you said makes sense. It's like I think it's of I think it's of questionable. I don't think I don't, listen. I don't think it's the smartest thing that guy's ever done. But I also don't think it's the stupidest. And and you know if if I if I'm about to go out, well, you know at least I have a picture of me before yeah. this guy takes me out. I I, I get that. I get that. I, it's just a crazy story. The whole thing's. Cr it, it, I I read some comments where people are like, this just proves that the. Egyptian security forces are terrible and the airport security is terrible. And I, that's a stupid thing to say. I, uh, well, mostly I, because when he went through security, he didn't have anything illegal with him other than his brain. Yeah, he, he didn't have a real bomb, so they didn't miss anything. Um, and I didn't realize you were supposed to give psychological tests before you go through security. So, you know, yeah. I, I, this is one of those unpredictable things that could happen. So, oh, well, glad it ended well. That's my I take. Yeah, absolutely. Obviously. I mean, right. Waking up to shit, there's a hijacking is bad. Getting to the point of the end where, you know, things actually worked well, worked out well is nice. Yeah. Nice to have a, a good ending. Um, so let's talk about some other stories that we've got on the, the list. Oh, you're skipping the destination, dude. Well, we'll do the destination last. Okay. Or do you want me to do the destination now? I can do the destination now. I don't know. We, we call it docs, lines, and destinations. All right, all right, all right. Destination is Berlin. So I just got back on Sunday from Berlin uh, from a week. It was, we were there for a week total. Kind of took a roundabout way to get there. Um, <laughs> went to – actually had a flight to Prague. And that was because the fares that were – that business class fares that came out last Thanksgiving were only good to, like, tertiary cities around Europe. They weren't good to – the hubs or anywhere in Germany, 
really. I say they didn't work anywhere in Germany, right? Yeah. So Prague's four hours by train uh, from Berlin. So it's kind of one of the closer, closer outside destinations that you could you could get to and still get there in the same day. So we did that, and I don't think I'll do that again. <laughs> It was it was a long day getting there. Like by the time we connected and got to Prague, got to the train station, I had to give myself enough time to like make the train. And so we yeah. didn't, we didn't get to Berlin until eight eight thirty at night almost. That's that's a long day. Yeah, so it was a long day. The good news was that we were tired, so we just basically went to bed, woke up at seven the next morning, and kind of just beat the jet lag with real with no real issues. Um, I'm still convinced that flying from the west coast is probably the hardest to Europe. It's 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 rough just because you're eight hours behind and it yeah it it, it's, it really throws you off. So, uh, but we had a good trip. You know, I I like Berlin. I think it's an under under uh, under noticed city or under talked about city in Europe. Um, from a from a tourist destin from a tourist perspective and just from you know just a a cool city. Uh, it's got a lot going for it and it's it's huge. Uh, I think it's something like four and a half million people in the city itself, six million in the metro, and uh, so it's 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 big and it has a very nice U-Bahn, S-Bahn regional train system. Um, it's relatively affordable. We did the seven day passes for uh, they were thirty euros a piece, which sounds is steep. that just transit or is it museums and stuff too? Uh, so the trans uh, if you wanted the museum, it was another ten euro on top of the thirty, which we weren't going to museums, so we didn't do that. Um, right. but, but that's actually, I mean, for like a city pass type pass, that's actually a very small incremental charge, I'd say. Yeah, it, it, you know, it it really was, and it was um, it it actually works out really well because the way uh the system works, if you don't use a day pass or like a seven day pass, is it's uh, I think you get three stops on like a one way ticket with one transfer, and it's I can't remember what the cost is. I think I want to say it's two forty five euros so you do like one round trip and you're already at five six euros and so the, the all day pass. Wait, but if you only get like three stops like three stations yeah so what if you need to go further you gotta you gotta buy another ticket like you can you can yeah. you can pay for two so when you use the ticket machine you can pay like you can put in your two destinations and it'll build the it'll build the ticket with enough okay of a cost built in there but if you but just do up. Yeah, it goes up, and so if you just but if you just do like a simple, I just need a simple one way. It'll pay, it'll charge you two forty five or whatever it is, um, and you get which the seems high if it's so a round trip, basically a round trip a day. The day pa- the week pass is cheaper. Oh, absolutely, and we used it we used it all over the place because sure. It's, well, I mean, once you have it, especially, but it, and if you're if you're gonna use like if you need to use the bus like to get back to the airport or something like. There's a bus like right in the middle of the downtown area, like the middle of the city, um, and the the pass works on that. Pass works on all the trams, which are really nice to get around some of the outer. Isn't the bus line? Isn't the bus line numbered like an airplane? Yeah, it's the. Is that seven fifty seven? Uh, what is like the that? one? The one to the airport is the one hundred, I think. Or the one hundred. Okay, that's. Oh no, you know what I'm thinking? Montreal does that. Yeah, and there's there's like Montreal's a Teagle. Is... There's a Teagle bus too. It just says TXL on okay. it. So. Okay. Never um, mind. I'm thinking of different places. But yeah, anyway. it, and and so there's a there's a lot to do. There's a lot to see. Um, a lot of people go for the Cold War museums, uh, the the Berlin Wall, um, some of the World War II history that's there. Um, we we've been before, so we kind of had like a different plan. We were going to eat a few places that I wanted to try, and we were also going to um, some kind of random destinations. There's a uh, there's a botanical garden there, which sounds stupid, but hear me out. No, yeah, that's nothing stupid about that. Uh, there, it's out, it's way out. I mean, it's far. Uh, it was about a 45 minute train ride, 30, 45 minute train ride, and um, but it's all indoors except for like the gardens and stuff. And it was pouring rain. I'm like, well, this is a good way to spend a rainy day because the stuff that's inside is really what we wanted to see. And it's all from their uh, colon like their colonization time period where samples were brought back, and they've kept the plants alive. From like you know they've um, bred them and continued to mature them from the from the 1800s 1700s 1800s so it's it's pretty interesting and uh, they have a lot of plants I mean it's it was incredible and so that was fun to do on a rainy day um, and and just kind of seeing uh, some of the old historic neighborhoods where it used to be a Cold War neighborhood and it was Russian uh, or East German and 
the building structures and you like cross over into West Berlin and all of a sudden it's just it's a different structure altogether. Uh, it's pretty pretty interesting. Um, just the way buildings are built and and uh, a lot, lots of interesting things. So, so we have a friend there. We have a mutual friend that lives in Berlin. Um, sure. And we he took us out to lunch one day uh, in in the Turkish neighborhood and. I have been to this neighborhood a number of times, and he explained though that in after World War II they were desperate for people to come help build rebuild the city, and so they said, "Hey, this is West, this is in West Berlin. Hey, come come help us." And the Turks were glad to have work, and so they came in droves and set up a real community there. And so there's a huge Turkish population. Um, so the food's amazing, and uh, come to find out. The East Berliners were doing the exact same thing, except that they couldn't call on any country to come and help. They only could call on communist countries to come and help. And so there's also a large Vietnamese population in East Berlin. And there's a interesting. Yeah, there's a there's a massive uh, Vietnamese market on the east side of town um, and really good food. So there's these two uh, kind of subcultures there that have assimilated into Berlin culture. Um, that I, I hadn't even thought about, like uh, that. Was yeah, that's really interesting. Yeah, so that was cool to learn about and see. And um, we had some, we had a really great meal um, there. And um, I will say, there's one place to avoid, and that's Gorlitzer Park. Um, which yeah, is, I, re- I read your like tweet about that. That doesn't sound like it was a good experience. Yeah, we had, we had known kind of about it, but we needed to get to there's a there's a famous uh, Russian war memorial on that side of town. And we wanted to walk that way, and so we started walking, and I noticed that people were coming up to us at the train station, um, young men, and I was like, well, this is odd. Like, last time we were here, this didn't happen. And then we get to the park, and uh, we're being pro- basically propositioned for drugs every 50 feet through this park, and it's a big park. Um, and other people were just riding their bikes, just ignoring them, you know, whatever. But it was it was not fun, and I, from what our mutual friend had told me, you know, it's kind of the place you don't want to go at night. Like it's interesting. It's a little rough, but uh, yeah, we had a, we had a good time. I mean, is this like pot or like heroin and coke? And I think crack? it's I think it's more than yeah. I think it's more than pot. So it's mm. it's uh it's a little bit of a seedy area. Um, there's there's a shirt in the neighborhood. Um, Kreuzberg is the name of the neighborhood, and it's it's kind of a rough it's a rough area. And there was a shirt in the window of one of the stores that said uh, "Welcome to Kreuzberg," and it just had a. a brass knuckles on the shirt and it's like that kind of tells you where you are a little bit um i but i i like the re- other than that particular area i like kreuzberg but it you know i thought it was funny um yeah so do you, do you want to know anything have you been have you been to berlin i've been once um maybe twice mm-hmm. um i know once i had uh, actually after one of our january drinking binges uh we were in Stockholm, I think, that year, mm-hmm. and I booked an award trip that involved f- uh, four overnights, and one of the overnights was Berlin. Um, straight, there was a schedule change, though, on my flight the next morning, and so I, I lost the morning, essentially. I had to race. Um, oh. So um, like I basically I like called United. It was like, oh, shit, change my ticket, and then raced to the airport, so I missed my morning. But it was – I had dinner with a friend uh, who lives there, um, different person than our mutual friend. Uh, and then, you know, and it was a lovely evening, but we, that could have been anywhere. Like she told me where to meet her. We sat down, we ate and drank all night long. And then it's like, Oh, gotta go. Yeah. She, she, she handled all the speaking German parts. And I, I did have an issue where the u there was some construction and like the train just stopped and everybody got off. Yeah. Yeah. And I was like, middle. Oh, this isn't my stop yet. And so I'm sitting there and like in the middle of town and people like came up to me like, no, you moron. They made the announcement. The Every, trains are everybody closed. off. <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, well, what do I do? Like, come on upstairs. There's a bus. And like, and whatever. I put in more money. I got on a different bus. Like, I eventually got where I was going a little late for dinner, but whatever. <laughs> um, so, yeah, it was uh, it was a, it was a fine visit, but it easily could have been anywhere. I mean, I did walk through the Holocaust Memorial briefly, um, like just the statues above ground, not the underground museum part. Mm hmm. Um, and I saw the gate area, but Brandon, because that's right near Brandenburg Gate, right? Yep. So I, I wandered around there a little bit, but got a couple photos and that was it. I didn't, I have not really spent time there in a way that makes it, makes me think that I experienced being in Berlin. Yeah. I, I think people, I think people don't really 
know what to expect. It's, it, I mean, it's a big. I mean, it's like a New York. It's it's big and you know it it kind of looks similar everywhere you go. It's you know it's all four story or five story walk up apartments pretty much everywhere. Um, bikers, bicyclists are a militant bunch. That's how they've been described to me, and I would say that's accurate. Like, don't walk in the bike lane. You'll get yelled at. They have no problem yelling at you. Um, so in that way, it's kind of like New York. I don't know. <laughs> you know, uh, the uh, but it, there's a lot of history there, and so I I encourage people to go because there's a, a lot of Cold War hit, Cold War history and um, interesting things to see, and it's easy to kind of find little niche history pieces spread out throughout the city that most people don't know about, most tourists don't know about, and uh, it's kind of easy to get lost and just walk around and enjoy the city. And people are friendly. Um, English is spoken pretty pretty readily. There's a few places we that they didn't really speak English, but um, yeah, I mean it's it's a great city. Weather kind of sucks in the winter and in the spring. It's like Portland, so yeah, interesting. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what else to add. I mean, I I I enjoy it. My wife enjoys it. Um, well, if you got a couple of di- restaurant recommendations, um, maybe we'll put those in the show notes. Yeah, sure. We went. To, we ate a, some really good meals. Um, I'll have to get our mutual friend to give me the name of the, the Turkish restaurant. But it was that Turkish restaurant was fantastic, and it was free, yeah. uh, free tea, free hot tea, and it was very affordable. Um, so it was it was great. And there's a great yeah. there's a great airplane model shop there. By the way, so <laughs> I spent some time there. Yeah, spent some some euros as well. I imagine I, I did that. I did so. <laughs> well done, good sir. Well done. Yep. So we have to talk about Emirates and Hungary. Um, there's some Fifth Freedom stuff coming up in Hungary, and the 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 talk has been that Emirates wants to kind of start a hub in Budapest, right? Kind of. This- I don't think they want to start a hub, but they they want to use it like they use Milan. Right, it's a fifth freedom route, you know, base for running flights from Dubai to Budapest and then from Budapest on to the United States somewhere. Um, United States is being assumed. It's not confirmed, but um, all indications are United States. So do you, do you think they'll run, you know, JFK, Chicago, those kind of flights through Budapest? I, I think I think you have to. Yeah. And and what's the draw? I mean, is the draw that you do you think they're going to get enough traffic uh, O and D to Budapest? Is it big enough of a city to to do that, or is this simply about feeding the Middle East traffic? That's hard. Damn right? good question, right? Yeah. I mean, there there is no more Malev, and even when there was one, it didn't fly long haul or it didn't fly in North America. I don't think did it. Uh, I don't. Maybe a long time ago. Not in the. Not, not I mean, the, not not recently. When yeah. The, the last nonstop service between the U.S. and Budapest was an American Airlines flight that went away uh, a few years back. So as they were sort of approaching their bankruptcy and, you know, retrenching. So it's easy to understand why the Hungarian government is incredibly supportive of this. Um, they, they're ecstatic to have anything good come along. And, you know, long haul service to the United States is going to be great for them. Um They've had the Dubai service for a little while. It's being upgaged from a 330 to a 777, mm-hmm. if I remember correctly. So obviously that's good for them. And being able to, you know, fill it with connecting flow is nice. I think, you know, I we have to, I don't know if the numbers are published or where you'd find them of what Emirates does in terms of the Milan service and how many people are connecting through versus sort of stopping off halfway. Um, it's right. It's not like the Singapore service to Houston where, a lot of people, you know, where both have strong O and D flow into Moscow, or they did when it was an oil route. Mm-hmm. I feel like I feel like that would be a little different because Hungary just doesn't have the same business draw as Moscow does. But I don't know. I I, I could see a, a mix of traffic there. Honestly, do you do you think that like so? Why Budapest? I I guess is my question in all of this. Why not Prague um, or another European city? Uh, Prague, Prague. I, I have, I, yeah, I, I would, I, I see what you're saying. I would imagine Prague is probably a little, you know, more stable economically and, you know, a better opportunity in that context. But I also have to assume that the willingness of the local government to support such a move has to be part of it. Yeah. Right. I mean, if you're, you know, may, maybe the Czech government didn't want to play ball. Yeah, I mean, I, I don't know. It's an underutilized airport. I mean, just being, we, you know, we flew there. We flew through there. Uh, they have a ton of gates, and maybe half of them are being used. 
you know, it's so I, that's why I'm surprised. I and it's more yeah. centrally located to Europe. You know, that's what you know what I mean. Like Budapest is so much further east. It is. It's only about 300 miles away, though. Yeah, it's true. It just seems further, I guess. It, it, yeah, gonna... it, it, it certainly is. I mean, it's 300 basically due east, but um, a little south. But I don't know. I feel like, you know, you've got Milan already. Now you've got Budapest. Like, you're you're not going to get the approval from a truly Western European country, Yeah, I would imagine. Um, even, like, a Poland is going to say, no, we're going to protect a lot. Yeah. So... You know, the fact that Italy didn't protect Alitalia is slightly bizarre, but sure. Um, <laughs> actually, I, th- I actually think that that was because Alitalia chose Rome as its hub and the people in Milan, which is where, the, you know, the money is basically were pissed enough that they were happy to get another opportunity to get a flight in. Yeah, I think you said it on the other sh- that one show. You said uh, Milan's where business gets done. Rome's where the tourists are. Yeah, <laughs> and it still is. I mean, even to this day, like even with yields being trashed, I think there's summer fairs like sub 500 round trip available that's crazy. um yeah i was looking at that the other day uh into milan even with those yields being trashed the airlines are still flying there because at the end of the day they're getting some the premium cabin yields aren't that trashed mm-hmm. and there are people flying that route for business yep so and so, at, while, while rome goes seasonal yeah and do you think do you think that so with the fifth freedom can they can emirates say fly to fly other places in europe would would they inside of from Budapest? I don't think so. Yeah. Right, right. So the way it's uh, it's being applied for, from what I understand, is it's basically it's a fifth freedom slot sort of thing. So they have access to two you know two fifth freedom operations, and they get to pick where to put them. But it's not like blanket fifth freedom. Okay. It's not it's not an open skies situation. Gotcha. So I mean they're, they're really looking at the U.S. and onward to to Dubai. Yeah. I wonder. I wonder how many destinations they would serve in the United States. I wonder if they'd do something like West Coast from Hungary. Yeah. No. Right now they're just applying for the two slots, so it would just be one flight. Just one flight. Okay. Yeah. So it's something. To, it's very similar to Milan, and uh, it, it, it's 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 it seems odd. The whole thing seems odd. It just one slot, you know, or the two slots. It does. It just seems like it's an odd thing to just say. Oh, you know, we're going to have one flight to the United States. Uh, I don't. I don't know. Maybe I'm being pedantic, but. Uh, nah, I don't know. Um, where do you where do you think I, they're gonna fly then? You think they'll fly JFK? Yes. So do you, do they eliminate a JFK Dubai route, or do they just is there that no, much demand? I think demand? they add. I think they add. And and, and is it an A three eighty or a triple seven? Uh, triple seven probably. Start, well, so, so that's interesting. Is right now JFK is all three eighties. Yeah. So putting in another three a triple seven, I don't know. So, but just Hungary is covered by the US EU. Open Skies Agreement, from what I'm seeing, mm. um, I think, as is the Czech Republic. So, yeah, I mean, I, I guess Emirates sees a market and they see the opportunity. They they got to fly their plane somewhere. They don't want them sitting around. So, yeah, I mean, they're, <laughs> they're still taking deliveries. Yeah, we got to we got to find somewhere to fly, guys. <laughs> oh, wait, no, Budapest looks good. So, <laughs> um, let's talk a little bit about the LA Beijing slots. We talked about a little bit about this last show with, yeah, we made a shit ton of fun of Delta. Let's call it like it is. Yeah. We made fun of Delta. We thought it was stupid. And then we come to find out that American is wanting to do the same thing. They want to start, um, uh, LA Beijing. Um, and they're actually competing with Delta for the slots, right? Yeah. There's only basically one, uh, set of slots available. Or it's seven, but it's, you know, one one daily route left open um, to a major tier one city in China. Yeah. And Delta applied for it. And like I said, we talked about that last episode and how it's made very little sense and how it's going to destroy the Seattle operation. Um, and now here's American coming along saying, oh, that seems like a good idea. We should have done that, too. And uh, both are proposing to start December 16th, same day, same everything, I think. The main difference is that American is likely to propose putting a 787 on the route as opposed to a Delta 777. Mm-hmm. Um, although, I, you know, hard to tell if that really is going to come into play in terms of making it, you know, making the decision. But yeah, it's it, uh, it's one question we never we didn't answer during that show was where was Delta going to get the plane from? What were they killing off to get the plane? Dude, seven million dollars. It's easy. Oh yeah, just buy another one, right? Yeah, yeah. Just I, like I, I'm sure. I mean. They've cut enough routes. I I wouldn't be too surprised to hear that they had 
capacity available with shuffling some stuff around. Yeah, I, I I don't I still don't get it. Like I don't get the L.A. Beijing desire. It seems like there's a lot of lift already there. Um, well, Air China has actually got the only nonstop. Oh, really? So yeah, when I looked it up, I mean, I don't know if I looked up the wrong thing last time or we didn't talk about it or what, but it's uh it's not great in terms of total capacity, mm-hmm. but it's also unclear that there's a ton of demand. Yeah, it doesn't seem like a city pair that has a lot in common. I mean, I, mean, I don't know. Yeah, I mean, right. I mean, L.A. has a certain amount of demand just because of the local traffic, and obviously that's useful. But um, there's also the agreement between United and Air China to sort of cooperate more, um, sort of pretending that they're not really colluding and creating a joint venture because they're not allowed to, but basically doing everything sort of like an everything but relationship. <laughs> well, what I what I see is I see uh, three L.A. Beijing's a day on Air China. Okay. So that's... yeah, so I mean there there is definitely some lift there, um, but it wouldn't be out of the realm of possibility that a little competition would be reasonable. Yeah. Um, China's also I mean now we're completely getting off topic I'm sure but yay me. <laughs> um, the China market just because of the way it a lot of the bilaterals have been negotiated over the years really separated out. Beijing, Shanghai, you know, the major cities from other airports. And so there's sort of tier one, tier two and tier three cities in those agreements. And they do a really good job of protecting the biggest cities and sort of making it you know, sort of having the reciprocity requirement where it's equal access and, you know, limited number of flights and all those things to sort of try to protect each other's major carriers. But you know, the access to the secondary and tertiary cities has gotten much, much easier. And in many cases, not even there's no restrictions like you want more access, just go. Yeah. Um, and so it's from that perspective, it really becomes a situation where like, you know, it's what United's doing. United is picking these extra cities and saying, screw it. We can make, you know, there's eight million people that live in this random town. Of course, we can make it work. Yeah. And they're going after them. They got the 787. Um, Beijing, Shanghai, and Guangzhou uh, are China Zone 1. Um, yeah. And then there's a set of another Fujian, Guangdong, Hebei, Jiangsu, Shandong, Tianjin, and Shijiang are Zone 2. And then everything else is Zone 3. And so, and I'm sorry, I butchered all those names. But um, Was was Cheng doing that list? No. So that's zone three. I mean, so I, I, some of those cities you named, I'd never heard of. I had heard of Chengdu before. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting that they, how they list. Yeah. I, and I don't know if it's based what, how they made them up. And also, I mean, this list is from 2007 yeah. is when they were, uh, picked, but yeah, that's basically how the frequencies are defined. And, you know, they added some additional frequencies over time, but it's, uh, yeah, there's China Zone 3. I'm trying to see, skim it here, see if Chengdu is included. I don't see Chengdu specifically. but Because um, you said it's Jiangsu? Yeah, sure. So those are those are actually like, it looks like those are regions. Like Shandong is a region. Oh, yeah. Okay. Jiang is a region. Fujian okay. is a region. So then there are some limitations on frequencies to some regions, I guess, which is even more bizarre. But yeah. Um, I, but there's things like the U.S. can pick five points in China that its airlines may serve without limitation on the number of flights, period. Like, mm-hmm. you know, of, of a list of these regions or cities, I can't tell. Um, and I think these are probably regions like pick five. Yeah. And and you can. Yeah, they can serve them without limits. So I'm guessing in some ways, like you, if United says uh, we want one of those points to be Chengdu, DOT is like, shit, I'm glad someone has an idea. I'm going for it. <laughs> Right. Yeah, <laughs> so no, I mean, you got some guy at the DOT being like, okay, well, what do we do? We we got five. Can we pick something? Can someone please pick something? Please? <laughs> please. Anyone? Anyone? Please? We'd like to, we'd like to use this. Oh. Yeah, it's uh it's a weird list, but do do you think that who who do you think is going to win out on this? Do you think because Delta applied first, do you think they'll get it? No. Okay. Um not, nece- not not necessarily just because of that, certainly. Um I, I think American has something of a reasonable claim that they don't have a West Coast slot to Beijing and Delta already does, mm-hmm. even though Delta put it in uh, Seattle. So arguably, um, that's 
a reason to give it to American. Um, beyond that, though, it's hard to know. I yeah. think, you know, you could claim Delta's is a better offer because it's a bigger plane. Yeah. And, you know, right, serving the public interest means getting the most people to destination. Yeah. Here's the... Speaking of like DOT getting to make discussions and me taking us terribly off topic, <laughs> what the hell is up with write a letter to our congressman or write a letter to the DOT supporting our application? And that's is like, does the DOT really choose which airline gets to serve Cuba based on who sends the most letters? Because if so, that's the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard of government operations. <laughs> and that's saying something. Yeah, please, please, please write write your con. I mean, it's yeah, it's. It's not write your congressman. It's write the DOT. <laughs> here's a form letter. Click at the top. Click at the bottom. Like put in your name and click send. Hey, Bill, got another one for Delta. Yeah, chalk it up. Yeah. Buddy. <laughs> well, and like, but they're talking about we got seventeen thousand letters of support. Clearly, people want us to be the one flying. Like, hey, who the hell are these seventeen thousand people that didn't have anything better to do? And B, is that really how? They choose like we got the most votes from something that no one actually knows they're supposed to vote for. Yeah. Democracy, baby. Except it's not. <laughs> if it was democracy, then we'd actually get to vote on it. <laughs> oh. and that ballot would be a disaster. Could you imagine what that would look like? <laughs> no, I don't even want to think about it. Um. <laughs> anyway, I just like the actually, I mean, there's a, I think it's an L.A. Times article about the sort of the airlines were all allowed to respond after the initial requests were submitted. And I think American Airlines called the Alaska Airlines submission stupid or fanciful or ludicrous. Like the language, they're not playing politics anymore. It was like, why the hell do they think they need twice daily service from Havana? We can only fill up a plane once a week if we're lucky. Yeah. Kind of comments. Yeah. Like it's, and they're not wrong, obviously. I think twice a week from LA was stupid. I agree with them, but I'm not, you know, supposed to be polite and cordial and a reasonable, like, business professional. I'm just well, some idiot with a blog and a podcast. Well, what's surprising about that, though, is that Alaska and American are apparently – are supposedly friends, you know, from a from a business well, perspective. And, and Except when they're not, right? And, I mean, and American's like, you know what? Screw you. <laughs> There's no yeah. way. There's no way you're going to be able to do that. And American's right. And American <laughs> also is completely self-serving in that they want their 16 or 12 flights a day from – uh, Miami or 10 a day from Miami, but like it's, yeah, I, I, I mean, I get it, but at the same time, like seeing the comments that they wrote back and forth to each other is kind of hysterical. Well, that brings up a good topic though. Um, nice segue there, sir. Uh, what's next? I don't even know what I'm segueing to. <laughs> well, just that, you know, we, we had talked about this previously where you, you mentioned during your trip report of Cuba, uh, that you thought that it was, when the tourists showed up, it was just going to be overwhelmed. And based on a recent New York Times article, uh, it sounds like that's the case. And tourists are coming, yeah. and it, the system can't keep up in Cuba with, with the demand. Yeah, I, I, thank you for reminding me of the segue. Um, yeah, you're right. I'm, I, I've been saying for basically since I got back, I don't know what the hell's going to happen here because they can't support it. Yeah. They just can't. And this New York Times article is basically, the headline is something to the effect of, now that like in in the race to beat all the other Americans, all the Americans are showing up. Yeah. Uh and there's not enough hotel rooms. The this article suggests that Americans aren't allowed to go to the beaches because that's not cultural immersion. So given that like eighty percent of the hotel rooms are on the beaches, that's proving <laughs> to be a challenge. <laughs> um and they quote one guy saying something like, you know, hotel rooms are going up to three, three, three hundred fifty dollars a night for the shitty places. Yeah. Um, Airbnb is doing business, but they they interviewed a couple people who were, you know, running some of the sort of bed and breakfast type operations and saying, yeah, we don't necessarily have water or gas, so we can't cook for our guests. Excuse me. We can't cook for their guests. And he visited 25 stores and more than half were sold out of soda or water, bottled water. And 12 out of 25 were sold out of chicken. Wow. Um, and, you know, and it, like I, when I was there, I mean, I was in some more more touristy areas. So you would have expected to see supplies if they had them, I guess. I don't know to put on a good or put on a good image. Yeah. Um, and I got photos of stores that are pretty empty. Uh, it, it, it is, in fact, that way. So, you know, fresh produce is generally available just because it's fresh and you get like guys who come in from the countryside with a cart and sell stuff on the street. Um, 
But I mean, but, they're they're already serving European and Canadian tourists. That's that's already happening. That's been happening for a long time. So now you're just sure. adding you're adding more people on top of that. It's it's yeah, it's, it's a straight numbers game. Like they, their tourist infrastructure can handle X number of people, and what we're giving them is X plus some thousands. Yeah. Um, and it's not thousands extra yet, but it's getting there. Yeah. It's getting there in a hurry. Yeah, and and as as flights open up, as more and more flights open up, um, there's more availability to people to go and and visit, and they're going to do that, right? Especially if it's yeah, priced right, I mean, they're going to they're going to go. Well, I mean, right, price right is an interesting one. Like the if the hotel rooms really are three hundred dollars a night, like I I paid way less than that. Yeah. I was also there off season. I think I was there during hurricane season, actually, technically. Um, so you know, maybe it's not the smartest thing I ever did, but it's I don't know, like. If they were charging double what they charged me for my hotel room, it would have been a ripoff. Yeah, I would have been a really upset tourist. Well, so um, so so then we're gonna get tourist reports back. Oh, it was a terrible place, third world country. You know, all, well, you're gonna get that anyways, right? Well, yeah. There's barely a cell phone network. There's barely communications infrastructure. There's barely roads in some parts. Like there's barely buildings in some parts. Yeah. So it's it's. I mean, I, I make it. It's not like this completely run down, decrepit place. It's there is some infrastructure there, but it is not what I think. You know, it's not designed to support tourism and the volume that is about to experience. Yep. And I think that's going to be very challenging for them. Yeah. And so it, 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 my, my, my it, biggest concern. Sorry, but my say my biggest concern is actually like there's a very narrow window here where Cubans and the Cuban people have the opportunity to sort of grow into it and recover and actually profit off of this massive windfall separately from the government, which clearly is going to profit very nicely and take lots of money off of people. Um, but if the tourism part and, you know, sort of, it's not just the hotels, those are all owned by the government, but it's the add on stuff, the sort of follow on tourism of the groceries and the shops and the markets and the restaurants and all that stuff, if they can't keep up and like under the sort of weight of all these extra visitors, then they want, you know, then I, I sort of feel like the U.S. is to blame for all the problems Cuba had up to this point in the last 50 years. And if then we all show up and crash the system, then we're we're in an even worse position because not only did we break it, you know, we, we damaged it. And then when we got there to fix it, instead, we actually crum- made it, you know, collapse. Yeah. Right, so I feel like that's on our head. Yeah. I mean, if you just overwhelm the system to the point where basic services aren't available and so people just refuse to go. Yeah. Then then you've done nothing um, because they're not going to build up the infrastructure if, if without the people. Yeah, without the people coming. So it needs to be a steady flow. I mean, it, it could have been a state. I think that where the failing really is is that it could have been a staged buildup of we're only going to give well, so many uh, visas and whatever. Yeah, yeah. I, I just there's a lot of things like that that could have been done. But and right in theory, it's still not for tourists. In but theory, yeah. When you say a cultural experience, I mean, right? There's a cruise ship that has gotten permission to visit. Yeah. That's actually going to be the easiest way to get there. Um, and did you actually see that? Like they published what their sailing schedule is. It's not it's not a like Eastern Caribbean and we visit Cuba. It's a week long cruise to Cuba. I didn't see that. And so it's like day one sail from Miami to Havana, spend the day in Havana. And th- like this is actually makes sense because a cruise ship is wholly self-sufficient. It comes with its entire supply of food on it and, you know, plumbing and beds all on its own yeah. and staff. I mean, right. It is its own mobile city. So the people can get off the boat, tool around in town, and then they have to get back on the boat to have dinner and to sail to the next place. It's the best thing for Cuba right now. Yeah. That seems really smart actually. Um, but you read the, like the itinerary is like day one, Havana, cultural immersion, day two, cultural immersion at sea, day three, some other city, cultural immersion. It's hysterical to read. It. It's like all about, no, this is legit. You're not just sitting on a beach and being a tourist. This is legit. We, we are going to make it completely okay per the, you know, the foreign asset control, Office of Foreign Asset Control rules and all this other stuff. It's just, it's really funny to me to read it because they're making, they're going way over the top in terms of saying, no, it's not, you know, a vacation. This is a cultural immersion experience where you're going to meet the people and learn and do. And there's no way that's what it really becomes like. Well, and hopefully in all of that, you're also injecting cash into the local market at some level. To help, yeah. you know, draw that that infrastructure up that you need to support more tourists when they do come. Absolutely, although it's, I mean, if, if you have to like the con- currency conversion process is also a pain in the ass. Really? For what that's worth? Yeah. Well, U.S. dollars are hit with a ten percent surcharge. Mm. 
because they can. Um, and like there's, you know, only so many currency conversion spots and they're all government owned and operated. So, so you have limited, it's not the worst thing in the world, but, but you have, it you have is limited ability to do that though. Limited ability yeah. to change your money. I mean, that's yeah. Interesting. Well, I hope it goes, I hope it gets better. And I hope that, you know, it, it, this, this prediction by the New York times and you are incorrect and we see some kind of leveling out in the near future. Uh, to just help them keep up, help Cuba uh, keep up and build. Yeah. Because um, it would it would be it would be a shame to see all of this um, the borders opened up and everything and and it, have it fail simply because it was too much too early. Yeah, I'm I and I, I, I hope I'm wrong, but I'm I've got my concerns and I I just don't see them supporting it on the ground. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I think that that's pretty much the show. You got anything else? No, nah, going to Hamburg next week. Oh yeah, aircraft interiors expo. Going to see all the new seats. Sweet. Looking forward to that. Sweet. Yeah. Maybe the new United seat will be there. Yeah. Keep your eyes. That's open. actually. Yeah. Keep my eyes open for something that seems to match that uh, rendering. Yeah. Uh, GoGo flew their 737 over. Ooh. You gonna get to get yeah. hang out on that? I doubt it. I mean, I, I I didn't get an invite for the flight. I'm a little disappointed. Would have been fun to you know try to test 2KU and record it streaming from up there. Um, <laughs> although it's on the it's on the ground right now, so that wouldn't work so well. It's also like the middle of the night. Because it's already over in Europe. Um, but uh, I don't think I'll have time for a test flight. I'm not even sure if they're doing test flights or what the game is there. But yeah. uh, they did bring their plane over. So that's clearly some good marketing at play. Wow. Um, wow. Honeywell is not bringing the, their test aircraft over. It's doing engine tests instead of Wi-Fi tests this week. Huh. I tried because that's, that's one I'm, I have yet to get to fly on. As the test aircraft go. Oh, well, that's a cool one to look at, too, because it usually has that engine the, on the side, you know. Yeah, it's the 757 with the extra engine up by the flight deck, yeah, which is just yeah. bizarre. But one <laughs> oh. of these days, man. One of these days I'll get it. <laughs> well, have a good trip. And I'm sure you'll have a report when you get back. Absolutely. Um, awesome. to, for our listeners, you know, uh, you can follow us on Twitter, at Dots Lines, uh, online, more dots, more lines dot com. Uh, on iTunes, leave us a comment, leave us a review. Love to hear from you. Uh, and thanks for listening. Talk to you later. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.